Whoa! <laughs> How's it going guys? So today is, well it's not today, but this week is the channel's one year anniversary. And this past week I've had one of those weeks where it was my anniversary. It was, well my wedding anniversary, my father-in-law's birthday. Uh, we helped my wife's grandmother move and my father-in-law and brother-in-law actually bought a piece of property so we went up there one day to check it out and then we went up, or I went up later on to go help clear some trails and do some work out there. So all week this video has kind of been at the back of my mind and I've been thinking about stuff that I want to have in the video. So I figured what I'd do today is obviously go through questions that you guys had for me uh, I figured because it's the beginning of the summer I'd probably go through my gear I've got this little table probably lay stuff out on there and go through the gear that I'll probably be carrying for most of the summer in case you guys wanted to see that uh, talk about my camera equipment and then I wanted to be able to cook a steak and then I've got a nice bottle of bourbon so that should be good but so yeah those were the things that I wanted to have in the video but I didn't really have that much time or wasn't really thinking about where I would go and planning the trip so we just came to this camping spot that we've been to before me and blue I wanted blue to be here as well and it was just easier to throw everything in the truck the trucks only like a hundred yards down that way but it was easier just to throw everything in there and that way we could bring everything we wanted to and I didn't have to worry too much this week about think about what I was gonna pack and things I was gonna need and all the rest of it so that's what we're gonna do hmm there's a bug on you there's a skeeter a mosquito a mosquito okay so let's yeah first things first let's go through my gear show you some of that stuff in case you guys have any you know questions and you want to see what I'll be carrying for the summer I mean first thing gear wise we should probably talk about is shelter tent the tent I have with me today is actually just our family car camping tent but the two tents that I will be using mostly for the summer are my mama EOS 1P which is the yellow one-man tent you've seen I do enjoy that tent it's quite small inside but I like it I like the fact that the the door is on the side and then you might have seen in my last video uh, a tent that I didn't really talk about and I don't really want to talk about too much because it was actually sent to me by a company it's uh, one tigress TP Nova they had actually reached out to me and wanted to send me a different tent and I said no because I didn't think I would use it and I, obviously if I'm not going to use it I don't really do review videos on this channel so they said no problem if you have if you change your mind and you want to look at any of our other tents then here they are and uh, that was actually a couple of months ago and then I was actually looking at obviously like I say I like that little marmot tent it's easy to set up but I just wanted something with a bit more of a traditional look about it and I'll be honest I was looking at tents and I didn't want to spend the money and I remembered that they'd offered to send me a tent so I looked and that was exactly the type of thing I was looking for so I'd give it a try but until I've used it thoroughly in different conditions and you know rain and wind and all things like that I don't really want to comment on it but I do like it so far I did enjoy it on that trip I like the look of it and I, I like the way it sets up so anyway that's shelters next we have packs this is a pack I just recently got this is gonna be my canoe trip pack for the summer it's a I want to say a sea line boundary 115 liter yeah 
Sea Line Boundary Dry Pack 115 litre. This is my canoe trip bag. I'm also pairing that with one of these little uni gear dry bags for 20 litre. This will fit all my gear, plenty of gear, and especially if I want to do longer trips. But I like to bring this with me because I don't know if you saw my other video, if I go on a day hike, I can put stuff in here, just sling it over the shoulder. But I can also put snacks, my jacket, my big camera, you know, my fishing tackle, things like that in here when I'm in the canoe. That way I can have it between my legs and I don't have to reach back and grab my big backpack. Sorry, Blue's going crazy. And then obviously, you've probably seen many times, I have my Granite Gear Crown 260. That's my backpacking pack. I absolutely love that pack. It's so lightweight, it's so comfortable. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend those packs. I actually got that from another YouTuber that I watch. And I'll talk about that because someone actually asked that question when I get to the question and answer stuff. But yeah, those are the two packs that I'll be using for the sum. <laughs> You're crazy. Next we have sleeping pad. Pretty standard. Thermarest. NeoAir x Light. I use this on all my trips. I use it in the winter, summer, spring, fall. In the winter I use it with my Reflectix underneath. And it's so far so good. I mean, I've had to repair a bunch of holes in it, but it works, does the job. It's the one I bring every time. In terms of clothing, these, I actually have a new shirt. This is new for this summer. I used to wear like the fishing t-shirts, long sleeves, but they don't have a great ventilation. I do love those, but they just, this has vents in the back here. Obviously you can unbutton it, but it also, I quite enjoy having the pockets on the chest. I can put snacks and stuff in there, whatever I want really. This is a Wrangler ATG hike to fish shirt. Uh, it's only like 20 bucks on Amazon. Really comfortable. I'm six foot. Uh, currently about 190 and this is a medium and it's quite a nice fit now not surprising to me really one of the questions I get most asked most about clothing uh, is about my pants my trousers my hiking pants uh, they can be kind of, I've you know I've been through a couple pairs now but again these are new for this summer I actually had a black pair and I wore them out the first day I tested in the canoe and with them being black with the sun beating down on me they were just so hot that I went out and got a lighter color these are actually Eddie Bauer guide pro pants these are my first pair of the guide pros my last pair of pants were Eddie Bauer Rainier pants and I like them they're good I'm not really a huge fan of the uh, how much this is my, one of my problems with men's hiking pants is I get why they're a boot cut but I don't understand why they always have to be such a heavy boot cut it's like you know it's just like they flare out so much at the bottom and that always drives me crazy the one thing the one reason I do like Eddie Bauer I went back to Eddie Bauer is because they do a lot of different sizes I'm kind of one of those in between sizes where you know 34 in the waist is a little too big and then 32 in the waist is a little too small just like you know 34 in the leg is a little too big but then 32 in the leg is a little too small so these are the closest I could get they do the in-between sizes so I got a 33 waist by 34 leg again I don't think they need to be a full 34 in the leg but I like the fact that they have those in between sizes and they have like if you look on their website they have a ton of different varieties so that usually helps um, but it also helps getting them on sale as well which is what I did and I think I paid like 50 bucks for them at the time in terms of extra layers for outerwear I have my Rab Xenon jacket 
It's pre-beloft insulation, synthetic, will retain its heat when wet much better than down. And then over here, I just have my standard rain jacket. I believe it's by a company called Paradox. I got it on Amazon. It's fairly cheap, but it keeps me dry. Spare clothes. This is one of those, from one of those cheap dry bag sets you get at Walmart. I like to keep my spare clothes in a dry bag because if they, if it rains, I don't want them getting wet. I want something dry to be able to sleep in. Or I once had a friend come stay with me and we were out and he didn't have any spare clothes and he fell in the water in the spring. He was freezing and luckily I had spare clothes for him to get in. In terms of what's in here, well, there is a thermal undershirt, you know, it's a Nike Pro, very warm inside. I have, normally I have an extra pair, but for some reason I haven't, I only have one of my extra darn tough socks, probably because our cat likes to steal them and make love to them for some strange reason, so there you go. Then obviously just a pair of thermal underwear. These are from Walmart. These are lighter weight ones for the summer just to sleep in. And then that's just a pair of, you know, Nike sports socks to sleep in if I need to. This is all a bunch of my other stuff. I've probably mentioned it before. I like to keep my stuff in these packing cubes because I hate it when I can't find something and my stuff's not organized or I have to dump out my whole bag just to get to something that's at the bottom. So I like to keep it all in this. First things first, Tokes 750 titanium cook pot with the bale handle. And I also keep inside a little titanium mug i believe this is the 450 mug the reason i started carrying the mug inside here is because a lot of times i find when i cook in this stuff burns to the bottom and then when i make my coffee and stuff in the morning it ends up getting burnt i end up with burnt bits in my coffee and it's just nice to be able to you know pour a cup without having to deal with that or my coffee tasting like whatever I ate the night before. My little grill. Sometimes I carry this, sometimes I don't. It depends on how long I'm going for, what type of trip I'm going on. You know, if I'm going on a multi-day trip and I'm not bringing like steak or meat to cook, then I won't bring this. But if I do have something like that to cook, like tonight, I will bring it. This is something I've been trying instead of my Thermarest Z seat. This is the Climate V seat. Just an inflatable cushion to sit on. Stop your butt getting sore. Obviously, I like this because it packs down smaller than my Z seat, my Thermarest foam butt pad. Illumination, I have my black diamond Moji lantern. I absolutely love this lantern. You know, it's just nice to have it turned on when I'm sat there if I want to read at night or listen to my audiobook, especially in the winter. I like the Yuko lantern, but this is obviously way brighter. And then in the summer, I don't bring a head torch. I have a little Coast HX5 flashlight the reason being if I need to I can carry it and I can point it around in the woods and obviously it's dimmable you push this back and forth and it's dimmable and you get a stronger beam you can also put a lithium battery in this and it gets way brighter uh, but also because I always have a peak cat I just put it on my cat like so 
and it doubles as a head torch. And I like how small it is. I normally keep it in my pocket in case of an emergency. Obviously, I have bug spray. 40%, sometimes I'll bring the smaller 100% deep. Hand sanitizer, even before this pandemic, I always had hand sanitizer in my camping gear because if I'm touching food, preparing food, steak, things like that, nice clean hands before I do it or before I eat. TP, wet wipes, Titanium fork, titanium spork. I have my cello stove, twig stove, which I like to bring with me in the summer, longer trips, especially now because I can't get hold of the gas canisters because a lot of places are closed and you can't get gas canisters delivered online. Not at least not where I live. Pair of leather gloves just in case, you know, doing work and stuff like that. Always duct tape, I got this at Home Depot ages ago, it's just, it came already flat, which I like. Low profile. Keep a roll of bank line in here. Sometimes I'll bring this, sometimes I won't, depends what I feel like. This, one of my favorite little pieces of gear. It seems so trivial. I've only had this recently, but it's a little um, air pump, which now won't turn on. The only thing I don't like about it is obviously this button. Like I say, there you go. I wish that was a switch and not like a you know, touch button. Because that is annoying, because sometimes it goes off. But I love using this to blow up my AirPad. Because I just do, like I say, longer trips, backpacking trips, I wouldn't bring this, but short overnight trips, it's just nice to have. It's by Flextail Gear, it's their Max Pump 2. And then I have some matches. I have some nasal spray because my allergies start to really bother me and I'll get a really bad headache so it's nice to be able to put some of this just a couple squirts in the nose before bed that way I can breathe properly and then in here this is where I keep a little first aid kit toothpaste toothbrush some tea some coffee little powdered creamer, some sugar, and that all goes in there. The other nice thing about this, having all this stuff in here, is when you get home, obviously you clean everything, you put everything away, and then you put it in here, and next time you want to go out on a trip, you just pick it up, grab it, stick it in your bag and go. You don't have to try and find every little piece. You know what I mean? Always keep a length of paracord, in case I want to set up a line, just to hang my stuff and dry it out. This is my ridge line. I bring this because it already has a bowl in, pre-tied in it, for ease of setup, and it also has my prussic knots already wrapped around it, so it just makes things a little simpler. Depending on what type of trip I'm doing, the Granite Gear Crown 260 is a great bag, but it doesn't come with a built-in uh, rain cover. So if I'm going on a backpacking trip, I have this little Uni Gear um, rain pack cover pack cover for the rain so yeah it's just something to keep in there my pillow love my pillow this pillow is awesome I've had a bunch of different pillows this one's by far my favorite 
Uh, I believe this is a Sea to Summit Aeros, and I think it's the large. I don't know if it's an Aeros Deluxe or if it's just an Aeros, but it's a great pillow. I like the fact it has a proper opening dump valve, unlike Thermarest, which is annoying, but it also has this little finger valve so you can set it as hard or as soft as you want to. Something that I just got, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, is Silky Gomboy, G-O-M-B-O-Y. And the reason why is because I have the big boy, but I found that it was a little too big to go in my pack. And it also didn't come with a case like this. So when I was using my dry bag, if you noticed on my last video, I didn't bring my saw. And the reason is I would slide it, obviously it would be closed, but I'd take my big boy and I'd slide it down the side of my pack. But the big boy has a gap here and the teeth are exposed. Like that. When you slide it down, it would catch on my sleeping bag. Obviously I don't want to rip my sleeping bag and destroy it. So I got one of these. That way, if I want to put it in the case, put it in my bag, I can. Or if I just want to carry it, or if I just want to put it in like this, it's not going to do a damage, although it doesn't have a lock, so it can come open. But that's the thing with the dry bag compared to my backpack is it doesn't have side pockets. Everything has to go in the bag. So, like I say, with my tools and stuff, they would get in there and they can damage my other things. And then also for sleeping, my hike and bike, Eolus 800, or yeah, 800 fill power, down sleeping bag, this is a 15 degree, comfort rating, yeah, the lower limit is 30 degrees, the comfort rating is around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it can be a little bit of overkill when it gets warm out but you can always just open it up and use it as a quilt if you want to or you know have it half draped over you and it's supposed to be about 50 tonight so it should work perfectly Get it. You kill it. There you go. Uh, put it down. Good okay. A lot of people have asked me where she's been. Obviously, she's been here. Well, no, she's been around. She's just been at home. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm away a lot on these overnight trips, and I do feel more comfortable when she's at home with my wife. And we've actually been working on doing some protection work right now. And I'll see if I can show you a little bit of an example of that. Let go. Good job. Good job. Attack. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Come on. You got it. Come on, Pity. Yeah. Oh, you got it. That's it. Come on. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah. Let go. Good girl. 
Attack! 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 Good. So I don't know if you heard that. There she is, look. So basically, I know it sounds scary when I'm saying attack, but I want to like assure you that I'm not teaching her to bite. It's never okay for her to bite, right? So she still doesn't bite people, you know? <laughs> you don't want a dog in your house that's gonna bite people. She, I'm not training her as a protection dog to be, you know, a human being mauler. What I'm training her to do is to interject. So what I'm doing there is I'm teaching her to bark on command. So she's at that stage. Well, the idea is to get her to a stage where she has barking on command down to a T. And then what you'll do is you'll practice having, when she's on the leash, you'll have someone come towards you or something. And if they start to approach you, you can say, you can give the command and she'll start barking on command and I know it sounds strange but when I was reading about this the person who wrote the article said you you know you know you speak speak as a command to basically what the person said okay was just like I said you don't want the dog to bite which I don't I don't need the dog to bite I don't want the dog to bite anyone I don't want her to associate biting as a good thing but what you want the dog to be able to do is interject in a situation between you and another person or my wife and another person. And he said, you know, use the command speak to get them to bark on command, which is what you would typically do. But then I thought to myself like, well, I'm not being funny, but if someone, if that's all I'm training her to do, you know, you know what I mean? If all I'm training her to do is to be able to bark at someone on command then surely if that person hears me go speak speak and she starts barking on command then it's gonna be kind of like that doesn't doesn't have the same effect as if I go start going attack attack and all of a sudden she starts going row, 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 row. you know that would that to me would deter someone like the idea is that the dogs obviously they sleep upstairs in our bedroom when I'm away and my wife and my other dog, Terence, God bless him, he just, he will sleep through an earthquake. He would sleep through a war going on outside. And the idea is that if someone to, were to come into the house, obviously we have other forms of protection inside the house. But if someone, someone were to come inside the house and they came up towards the bedroom and they could hear my wife saying, Blue, you know, attack, and they can hear this dog going wah, 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 wah. on the other side of the door. As you're giving that command, they'll probably a think twice about coming in that room, or if they do come in that room, uh, you know, that split second where she interjects could make all the difference. Does that make sense? Because say, I'm not teaching her to to bite or be aggressive. She still she won't bite to save her life. Like she doesn't have it in her. That's one of the reasons I'm doing it with her, and I know I'm probably talking about this a lot, but the reason I'm doing that with her, and the reason I've started with her now and not got another dog is because I've had her for a while, and she has the right temperament, she's not aggressive, she's never shown aggression, you know, she knows, she's already been trained from a very young age of a puppy not to bite, but she also, I know she has the drive, like I've been able to teach her to do that in the last two weeks and she's four so it's all those things like I watch a lot of videos about you know protection dogs and things like that and like they say the most important thing especially if you have if it's one that's around your family is the right temperament and I've had her long enough to know that she has the right temperament but she also has the right drive for it so that's why I'm doing it with her and I didn't just go out and get another dog and try and do it with that dog because you don't know
nothing fancy but it's good like I say I do have something very special to toast with but I was just trying to recreate my one of the moments from my first video grabbed this yesterday one of the moments when I'm sat by the fire and I crack a big can of Bud Light I can't remember exactly what I said but still feels good very similar days as well last time I well not last time but in my first video it was kind of like this kind of grey and overcast and Except that day was a lot windier and much colder. I remember having to wear my hat and my stuff. And there's a lot more bugs today. The black flies, like I say, are out now. And they keep... I have permethrin on, but I keep feeling them crawling up under my shirt and stuff. Blue's obsessed with a chipmunk that obviously lives just there by the camp, so... That's all she can focus on. But, what I think I'm going to do now, once I have this, and wait for these coals to burn down, is do the Q&A. So let me do that. I apologise if you hear any background noise. There's a group of, I'm guessing, college kids, judging by the cars and stuff I saw drive past on another campsite over there so number one first question I'm just gonna answer a couple questions that I get asked all the time and talk about them questions I get asked all the time where do I live where are you where are you camping where is this located and as you might know I really don't like to give out that information uh, for two reasons which probably isn't what people want to hear, but, you know, reason number one is privacy. When I first started YouTube, I read an article on the BBC about a YouTuber in Korea, a girl, and she basically would get the train every day. She was a vlogger, right? And she didn't give out any information, but what happened was a guy paused the video, zoomed into the reflection in her eyeball and saw which train station she got the train from every day, went to that train station, waited for her, I don't know how long he waited for her, but he waited for her until he saw her get off the train one day, then he followed her home and attacked her, which I know is horrible, right, it's horrible. Now, I'm not saying I'm as interesting as, you know, a young Korean girl at all, but, you know, these things do happen. A uh, subscriber was telling me or pointed out that something had happened to Doug Lineker from Doug Outside, Joe's friend, someone, a subscriber, turning up at his work. I know 99% of people aren't like that, but still, I'm a, like... It's, I know it seems odd because I do this, but, and I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but I didn't have any social media until I started this YouTube channel because I value my privacy, you know, I do, I, I don't like, you know, especially when I'm doing this and I'm away on overnight trips, like, I don't really like people knowing where I live, um, so that's that. Now when it comes to where I am and my location where I camp and stuff, uh, the reason I don't give out that information, and as much as I hate to say it, I guess you would, I, you know, doing this, I'm what you would call an influencer. I can't even say that, that sounds terrible. But you know what I mean, you, you know, as an influencer you have a, the, I'm not, I hate saying that because I'm not, but, <laughs> You know what I mean? Either on purpose or subconsciously, you have the ability to influence people's decisions and behaviors. And I have read a lot of articles about geotagging, right? Which is 
basically what's happening in national parks and at national monuments and campsites and places like this is because of social media and people doing what I'm doing or you know Instagrammers going there and taking pictures and then they give out they tag the location they tag the location or they give out information about where the location is and what's happening is these places that were used to see so many number of visitors a year are now seeing like five times that number of visitors per year and the places can't handle it basically they can't you know they can't keep up the places are getting damaged because of this inflow this influx of people because of social media because of geotagging because the information is right there so that's the other reason I don't really talk about where I go camping, my, you know, the sites I use, the name of lakes, the name of trailheads. Not because I want to keep them to myself, I don't. It's, the information is there for people to find if they want to find it. But I don't want to just give out the information, you know. Like, I might have, let's, you know, think about it. Like, if even a tiny percent of people who watch my video decide they want to go to a location I'm at that could increase the number of people who go to that location massively you know so that's the other reason I don't give out the locations of where I camp and tra like I say trailheads and things like that just because uh, you know these areas need to be protected and a lot of places where I'm camping then they're based on a first come first serve basis so there's no there's no permits, you don't have to reserve anything, it's backcountry camping, you don't need a permit, you, there's no one managing the number of visitors, it's just there for people to use. And like I say, if I start giving out all that information and more and more people are using it, then it, uh, it makes it difficult for the forestry service, you know, the wildlife people to keep up with that. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that, but you know, like, like I say, if if I'm gonna be an influencer, I guess you, I would like to be conscience, conscious of my influence, right? So that's that. What else is there? Oh yeah, so next question I get asked a lot is what camera do I use? Uh, people, as you've probably seen, I have, currently right now I'm using a GoPro 5, which I've had for ages which I hate, I hate the GoPro, I never used it before. In fact, like I said, I had it a long time, never used it. The battery life was terrible. The audio is terrible. And I'm pretty much now reserving that for action shots. I was gonna use it as, well, I was looking at getting one of the newer ones, see if that would be any better, but from what I've seen and the reviews I've read, and even with different ones, it's like, they're trying to improve them, but they're just not quite there yet. So I'm going to wait and see if they bring out a newer version. And hopefully that will maybe fix the problems that the current ones have. I don't know. But for now, my GoPro is going to be reserved for, you know, just action shots. I'm not going to try and record audio on it or anything like that. My other camera, my big camera that I'm recording on now is a Panasonic GH5 with a 12 to 35 millimeter lens and it has a Rode Video Mic Go. Uh, you know, when I bought that camera or my big camera, I could not afford <laughs> that big camera. I had a Canon G7X Mark II little point and shoot camera and I'd used it, I'd used it for a while. I probably only used it a couple months. And I felt like my videos were, were decent. I felt like they were, you know, I was getting a good, um, you know, timeline together type of thing. I was starting to figure out editing. And the, the wind noise killed me. Every time I heard the wind noise in the camera, because it only had an internal microphone, it would kill me. And, you know, like I say, I could not afford that camera, the camera I've got now. And 
I I just went for it, you know. I went for it. I took a risk. I essentially, you know, I invested in myself and I invested in my channel because I felt like it's what it needed. And I can say now, uh, you know, after well, I, what I probably got this camera in September of 2019, and I can say now that my YouTube channel is probably about broken even with the cost of the camera. I've been able to pay off the camera and, you know, what I've made from YouTube and ad revenue has been enough to pay off, to pay for the camera basically. But it's, you know, it's not, so for people who want to know this information, I'm sure it's because you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel yourself. So be conscious of that, you know, like I say, if you, if you believe that, if you believe in your channel and you believe in your content, and you believe it's good. When I bought this camera, I had like a hundred subscribers, but I felt like if I was ever gonna, you know, improve, if my channel was ever gonna grow and improve, then I needed to invest in a better camera for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously the wind noise, the audio with the internal microphone just wasn't what I wanted it to be. It just wasn't good enough. Uh, number two is that little Canon G7X is not weather sealed. Now, weather sealed and waterproof are two different things. Obviously waterproof would mean, depending on the IPX rating, would mean that the camera is submergible, like a GoPro. You could get it wet and things like that. Weather sealed just means that, you know, it can withstand some rain and some dirt and a bit of snow and it's not going to completely kill the camera which obviously as an outdoor youtuber is what i needed the other thing with the panasonic gh5 the reason i bought the panasonic gh5 weather sealed i could attach an external microphone and it has a flip out screen which a lot of the other bigger cameras didn't have but i like the flip out screen and the other reason i bought it I went with that one specifically is because it can shoot in 4k and it, like I say if you're thinking about getting a camera to do this keep in mind that things are going to start moving towards 4k uh, I used to shoot in 4k and I've stopped I've gone back to 1080 because the file sizes were massive uh, they took forever to upload, forever to export from my editing software. Like I had a two terabyte external hard drive that I bought, thinking that would be plenty. And I filled that up so quickly, it just wasn't enough. So I went back to 1080p. But, like I say, things are going to start moving towards 4K, so exporting times, uploading times, the storage size, that's all going to improve. So, like, okay, so my Canon G7X Mark II, my first camera that I bought and I used, that was $650. Three months later, when I tried to trade it in, Best Buy offered me $58, right? These things go out. You know, th these things, uh, electronics lose their value very quickly because they're always bringing out something new every year. So keep in mind, it was better for me, I felt it was better for me to invest that little bit extra money now and have a camera that was future proof than invest, well, you know, invest more money now and have a camera that would last longer and be future proof than invest a lot of money find that all of a sudden now I've got to sell that camera and invest in another one you see what I mean like you spending a little bit more money now is going to save you money in the future so that's what I did I mean I knew nothing about cameras before I started doing this uh, I still don't know what half the functions are on that camera but I really enjoy it, I really like it. Like I say, I've had it out in snow and rain and I've dropped it, it's been in the dirt and it's fine, it's lasted. 
and it's it's doing pretty good so I like that I like that and then the next question I get asked obviously is about blue where is she uh, obviously she's here right now but as I said before it's just nice to know that when I'm away she's there at the house I trust her she like I say she's she uh, has a great temperament, but she has very good protective instincts, and it's just it just it's just a comfort to me to know that she's there. You know, like I say, even though we have other things at my house with security system and um, you know other forms of protection in the house, it's just nice to know that she's there. She's like a an you know an alert system, which is nice. It's nice to know, and. Yeah, she'll probably be coming out with me more. I don't know. I have been very seriously considering getting another dog for that very reason. You know, just because I like having a bigger dog at the house. I've always grown up with uh, dogs. I grew up in the you know in the country and we we had dogs and we had more than you know we had <laughs> three four dogs at a time so i quite like that idea i don't know i don't know i'm thinking about it i'm thinking about it the problem is all the dogs that i want are like you know quarterly like rare hard to get hold of like expensive that's my problem and then I have this dog that I love, I absolutely adore, I can't like, you know, that's the, that's the other reason why I, I think about it and then I never do it is because I love this dog so much. And it, I just, it would break her heart if I had another dog and I brought another dog and not her. I could I just, she'd be so upset and I couldn't do that. She's my, she's my baby, she's my baby, so. So yeah. So I'm going to turn up the aperture in this camera because it looks a little dark. And then we'll get into some of your guys' questions. I wrote them down on my little waterproof notepad. So let's see what we have. Let's start at the beginning, shall we? Okay, so first question, Todd Little or Liddell, a Keystone Archer. What is my number one adventure on my bucket list? Uh, that is a very good question. I have been thinking about the answers. There's so many that it's so hard to decide. I mean, right now, I think maybe, I'd love to go to Yellowstone. Yellowstone's really high up there. Uh, and I'd love to go to Alaska. You know, or like somewhere like the Yukon, somewhere with like really crazy wilderness. And then obviously, you know, I think those are the the two more realistic options right now. Uh, obviously, I'd love to go to Patagonia. And I think if we, I think if we were to break it out in terms of like, which would be my number one adventure, like guided and unguided i think a guy unguided trip like i say would be yellowstone or alaska and a guided trip would probably be the amazon the amazon rainforest i'd like to go and do that and see that but like i say there's so many i'd love to go all over the world you know i like I'd love to, there's so many things I still want to see here in the States. There's, in North America, there's things I want to see in South America. There's things I want to see in Africa. There's Australia. I mean, there's so many, but like I say, number one right now for me to tick off the list is Yellowstone. I'm going to say Yellowstone. So next question is from Leanne Explores, who also named the canoe the SS Demo because of the, the demo tag in it. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, first question is favorite fish to catch and eat um, I would probably say trout Just because I haven't caught that many and eaten them. I think I've caught a perch and ate it as well I don't think I've ever ate bass. 
I would love to try walleye. Walleye is apparently really nice and I've still never caught a walleye. Um, I was going to say one. I'd probably say brook trout right now. Uh, that brown trout I had was really nice. Uh, and I, I've had rainbow trout, but rainbow trout's... Uh, I don't know, the rainbow trout's kind of a bit more oily. It has a different texture. I really like a bit more of a flaky fish. So I will, I'll probably say brook trout right now. Oh, I've had lake trout as well. Lake trout's really nice. So probably one of those two is my favorite fish to catch and eat but like I say that's all I've caught and <laughs> caught so far so do I ever go to Leanne Explores also asks do I ever go to the coast to go to camp and fish uh yes I do when I can uh was it last year last year or the year before we went to Acadia in Maine my wife my son and I and my son's friend we have friends who live in Kittery, Maine. So we go out to visit those guys a lot. And I was hoping to go out there a lot more this summer. Obviously with everything that's going on, I don't think that'd be a sensible idea, not just yet. Maybe next year, I could say, I would love to go out there more. And I'd love to do some more coastal camping and fishing and things like that. So yes, I have, and I would like to do more of it. Leanne Explores also asked, what made me get into camping and bushcraft? Um, you know, I don't, it's a difficult one. It depends how far back I go. I mean, obviously, like I said, I grew up in the country. One of my earliest memories of, I have of when we moved into our house. I was probably four or five when we moved in there. And then I remember my dad taking us in the woods behind the house and teaching us how to start fires, which is something he later learned to regret because after that we set fire to everything. <laughs> it's just a terrible. Uh, but then I also, I remember, you know, one of my first fascinations with America and the US especially was him watching like the old cowboy and western movies and really just sort of being infatuated with the scenery and you know the, the scenes of the cowboy sat around the campfire in these like beautiful locations down by a river somewhere and it just seemed like so serene and peaceful and then also but then also I you know I you know I used to love the Native Americans you know, they were you know, they were always like the original sniper, you know? They just, the way, they always seemed to be like ghosts. They, they, you never knew they were there until like all of a sudden that, you just hear the and that one cowboy would be there with the arrow on his chest and he'd slide off his horse and it'd be like, oh, they're here, but, uh, you know, so I remember thinking like, oh my God, how cool they were, just the way they could move through those environments undetected and stuff. Uh, and then growing up with Ray, like seeing Ray Mears on TV and David Attenborough, just loving nature and the outdoors and, you know, it was just something to do. Once we could drive back home in England, me and my friends, we'd go out to the woods for the day and hang out there like, you know, like teenagers do. And then I was starting to get more, you know, a little bit more into it, taking a few trips to Scotland and stuff. And then obviously I moved here, I drove, you know, first time I was here, I had a car, I had a rental car for two weeks and I drove up into these mountains and I was just like so blown away by it. And then it was just a slow progression. Like I say, it went from, you know, car dipping my toe in, just driving around. And then from there, it's like, I want to get out and do more of it. So then, you go on a day hike and then you're like, okay, well now I want to spend the night. So you do some car camping and then you think, oh, I'd love to do a canoe trip. So you go on a canoe trip and then it just slowly keeps building and building. I think it's just one of those things if you, when you find something that you're like, yeah, I really enjoy this. This is something I'm passionate about. It just sort of grows and grows. 
So, and Leanne explores. Next question, are there stickers with the logo to buy? Uh, so far, no. Uh, I've been considering it. I've been, I've been looking at different options. Uh, the main thing is just, you know, trying to find something that's feasible, that's viable. Uh, whether I'll be able to do something myself or get an outside company to be able to do that. The main thing is what, um, you know, I've, like I said, I've been thinking about it. One thing that I would like is to be able to not just do merchandise, but like gear, you know, gear. Like I don't, like I'd like something that I feel is actually usable for people in the woods but uh, you know stickers and one thing I've looked at a lot recently with this coming up is stickers and hats because I feel like they're universal and you don't have to worry so much about the different sizes so maybe maybe in the future if people if people want stickers and stuff I know my stepson was asking me if I had a sticker I'd love to put one on the canoe and on the truck so so yeah, that's something I'll look into. There aren't anything there isn't anything currently, but I'll look into it and I'll see. I'll see. So Chad from GB, what are the bushcrafters uh, slash YouTubers do I watch slash recommend, I'm guessing. Uh obviously Joe. Joe Rovinet. I love watching Joe's videos. Uh, he's the one that got me into YouTube. He's the one that started me on watching YouTube videos just like I say, wanting to learn more, spending those winters watching his videos. Um, videos that I try to dip into, like I watched Corporal, like I said, I watched Corporal Corners, uh, Corporal's Corners instruction videos on how to do knots and different techniques. I don't really watch his overnight videos, I will admit. Uh, then. Bushcrafters is kind of difficult. The trend these days on YouTube is, you know, with bushcrafters seems to be like these silent movie, not talking bushcrafters, and I don't really watch those. I don't really like them. I kind of feel like they just romanticize this idea of, you know, dressing like an 1850s frontiersman and going into the woods with gear that's old and heavy and antiquated. <laughs> so I don't really. Don't really watch those guys. Um, in terms of other YouTubers that I watch, I watch a lot of the Guggen Squad. I don't know if you don't know who those guys are. Obviously, being a, a very terrible angler, I like to try and pick up as many tips and techniques as I can. So I like to watch those. Uh, I like to watch my own frontier, a guy called Joey. Don't know if anyone else watches him. He does like hiking and backpacking videos mainly out west. He goes to some really beautiful places. He does. He has videos of Yellowstone, uh, Glacier, Utah, all over. The guy's living the life out of his van, hiking all these places. So I watch him. Uh, who else do I watch? I watch Darwin on the trail. I don't know if anyone watches him. He's like a lightweight, ultralight backpacking guy who does like through hikes, the Appalachian, he's done the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, talks a lot about ultralight gear. And I like watching him. You know, I would say my style, a term I'm coining, it might mean something different, but I would consider myself a bush packer, <laughs> which <laughs> sounds terrible when I say it out loud, but basically what i feel like that is is it's a, a sort of a combination between bushcraft and ultralight backpacking which i feel like is kind of modern bushcraft like i say there's these some of the other bushcraft youtubers that i watch you know they don't say anything and they they bring out all this old gear and stuff i just like I feel like the reason they don't talk and the reason they don't say anything is because they don't want to say <laughs> like how how annoying it is to carry that stuff. Like I enjoy changing out my gear, I enjoy trying different pieces of gear, I enjoy figuring out what works best on what trip. You know, it's just one of those like those things I enjoy. I'm always trying to 
you know, improve my outdoor experience. And I feel like bushcraft, bushcraft is, uh, you know, defined as skills for living in the wilderness. I think at some point someone wrote this book about what bushcraft is and it's for some reason that seems to be set in stone. And it's like, unless you have, you know, unless you dress this way and you bring these, uh, you bring this gear, then you're not a bushcrafter, but that's not the case. It doesn't, there's no way that it defines like what gear you need to bring. Obviously it's skills, it's a craft, bushcraft. So you need certain tools to perform certain tasks, but in terms of like, you know, your clothing and items you like to bring, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's whatever you want to do. It's whatever you choose. You know, it's your it's your time in the woods and it's your experience. So, so bring whatever you like. That's how I feel about it. So yeah, I watch a lot. I watch a variety of stuff on YouTube. I'm trying to think other bushcrafters that I watch, but no, I can't really think of any. Um, so yeah. And then Chad from GB also asks, American football or soccer? Uh, I mean, I'm a sports guy. I am sports guy all the way. Like, I will watch all sports at any sports. Obviously, there's some sports that I don't love. Uh, I, you know, grew up playing sports. Uh, you know, I ran track, played rugby played cricket, uh, yeah, play soccer. I like watching American football. Uh, it, I'll admit, it kind of gets a little boring in the middle, but the first quarter and the fourth quarter are all right. Uh, I'm a huge, I am a huge soccer fan. Big football, well, we call it football. Huge soccer fan. Arsenal is my team. Our other dog, his name is Thierry. He's named after Thierry Henry because I'm an Arsenal fan. And I know I'm from Leeds and I support Arsenal, but that's because, you know, no one in my immediate family, no one else apart from me watches football or soccer. Like my dad used to race cars. Uh, my brother races cars. They both love the F1. My younger brother, he was always into rugby more. And my sister, you know, so when I was growing up, when I first started to pay attention to soccer, like Thierry Henry was the man and I just loved him. I just loved the way he played the game. And I just wanted to be able to play like him. So yeah, um, caught, sort of made me into an Arsenal fan. And then obviously from watching him, found Dennis Bergkamp and just, just loved the way they played the game. So yeah, obviously I'm soccer all the way, soccer all the way, but like I say, any sports, I love sports. I love sports. I do. Like, I just love them. I just think they're, I don't know. I've just always been attracted to physical activity, you know? I've always enjoyed that more than like, you know, reading a book or sitting at a desk. I'd rather be playing sport, talking about sport. So yeah, definitely, definitely soccer. But I also like American football, you know, my wife's a huge Giants fan. So I'm a Giants fan now. But again, with them, like, they got Saquon Barkley, and I just love the way he plays. I love his, you know. So I've got a Saquon Barkley jersey, and I wear that in American football season. And the nice thing is now on NBC here, they show the Premier League games in the morning. So as if I'm not doing anything I can get up I can record the games or I can get up in the morning sit and have my coffee and watch some soccer which is nice when it was on so that's it Chad from GB also asked when I'm filling up my water bottle why do I drag it and not submerge it in the lake uh, that's a good question and the reason for that is <laughs> that's what I've seen other youtubers do that's the only reason I can give for that. That's one of those things like, I don't know why I do it that way. That's just what I saw Joe do one time. So that's what I do. So yeah, which reminds me, someone also asked me about my water filtration. So I have to have a look. Oh yeah, okay, so on that topic, Eric P asked, 
what water bottle slash filtration do I use? And I have it here. So Catadine B3, one liter. I like this because, like I say, I've watched um, like Darwin on the trail. He talked about the Sawyers. He always had the Sawyers. This has a much better flow rate. It doesn't last as long as the Sawyers, but you can drink from it much easier. Obviously, the Sawyers can just attach to, hey, Petey, a plastic bottle, like a plastic water bottle. This, you need this bag, which is kind of annoying. And obviously, as you can see, you can puncture it. But that's what I use, a cat, is it, yeah, Catadine. No, I don't think it'll focus, but Catadine B3 one liter. And then with that, I don't know if you've watched my last videos, I bought this at Walmart for three bucks. This is a little one liter collapsible water bottle. And it's worked great. I like the fact that I can, you know, take this, fill this up, squeeze it down into there, fill this up. And then all of a sudden, and then I can drink out of this and I've got a liter if I need it. Um, but obviously this was, it's kind of cheap, it was only three bucks. So this sort of like keeps coming open and this doesn't stay on and this comes unscrewed. So I bought this one, I haven't opened it yet. This was I think like $12 on Amazon. But I bought this because it's, this is by Platypus. And this is a two liter so I can get more water in here. And it just has this like latch and this just feels much better, much more solid. And obviously it has carabiner built in on the side so you can clip it onto things. But it's, that's nice because the problem with the dry pack, like I say, for the canoeing, it doesn't have side pockets. So everything has to go in the bag. And when I bring my Nalgene, I either have to bring it full of water, which adds weight, or I have to put in empty, which just takes up empty space. So having this that collapses down means I don't have to worry so much about that. To say I can just fill this up, squeeze it in, fill this up again, squeeze it in, and I've got two liters of water. I can keep that at the camp. I can bring it with me on if I'm hiking around during the day. Uh, I can keep it in the bow, whatever. And yeah, and I also know that if I drink a full one of these, and I drink one of these, then I've had three liters of water for, a day, for the day, which is good, obviously, when I'm working and I'm moving, you should be drinking more than that, but if you can get three liters, that would be ideal. Where was I? Okay, so DJW, Dan, DJW asked, how do I keep my batteries topped up when I'm out and about? And that is a good question. So I keep my camera gear in another one of those cheap dry bags from Walmart, no matter if I'm canoeing or backpacking. I have, this is just a case, obviously I have some extra memory cards in here. I have a 128 gig memory card in the camera which gives me like 10 hours of filming on a in 1080p which is fine which is good for my big camera I don't know if I can charge it yet uh, I've got to try it but I have obviously a battery in the camera and I have two extra batteries and normally a battery in the camera lasts me about a day so on an overnight trip I normally get through about one and a quarter one and a half batteries worth and then i have an extra so that's why on the my i've been bringing the gopro as well to try and break up some of that uh you know break up the battery life and change it but then i also have this which i just got recently and i actually really like and for anyone who has teenage children i recommend getting one of these I bought the smaller one, they make a smaller one. This is the, I think this is the 20,000, yeah, this is the 20,000. And I bought my steps on the 10,000, which is smaller because his phone's always running out of battery and then I can't get hold of him. So he can charge it on the go. Again, I got this from Darwin on the trail. This is, he uses the smaller one to charge his electronics when he's out on trail. But I think I got the bigger one because like I say, I didn't know how much juice my 
big camera would take or if I can even charge it this is a PD version which I can't remember what PD stands for but it basically means things charge quicker and I think I can charge my iPhone like three times with this with a full charge something like that an iPhone 10 three times so it's been good I know and I've been using it like I said I only have one battery for the GoPro I can charge the GoPro with this I know the GoPro this will charge the GoPro I haven't tried it with the big camera yet I'm not sure if it will work uh, but yeah so this is one thing that I've just started re unit using recently and it's just a good thing to have like I say I can charge my phone I can charge my GoPro and I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to charge my big camera but if not I'm gonna look into it but yeah anchor power core uh, my power bank thing so that's that so I think DJW Dan also asked and I'm sorry if I've attributed this to the wrong person but how do locals react when I speak um some of them don't even react and then others ask you know where where I'm from and I can honestly tell you more people think that I'm Australian than British I guess because I have a northern accent and I don't talk in the Queen's English and the way they would expect a British person to talk and I obviously I being I say mate a lot so uh yeah normally pretty good I think you ask like because I look American and I do look American now so I think it kind of confuses them a little bit but everyone's pretty nice I've never really had any problems with anyone to be honest only one guy one time but that was not a big deal so yeah they react pretty positively when I speak most people are just curious and they want to know where I'm from uh, the best thing is like everyone asks whereabouts in England are you from and I say well I'm from the Leeds area and as soon as I say Leeds it's like crickets you know what I mean they, they have no idea where that is so and I'm like it's, it's about you know four hours north of London and like oh yeah I know where London is so so oh, yeah okay Sherry Sikora how do I find primitive sites uh, I do a lot of research uh, it all depends state by state obviously uh, the, one of the big things I tell people is look at your local state's fish and wildlife service uh, website or the environmental conservation websites sometimes that has the information on that you need uh, other times you might get lucky and find you know someone's blog someone discussing it uh, the main thing is just to like research it and look on the internet I've been in it long enough now that I have a pretty good idea of where to go uh, the information in my state anyway is also once you know where to look it's there's a lot of great information and I actually take I pull uh, they have maps which show the campsites and I actually pull those up on my phone and screenshot them so I have them on my phone so I can look into it whenever I want so yeah I mean like I say environmental um, environmental conservation websites for your state and um, fish and wildlife services websites for your state so that's normally pretty helpful B Rich asks did I bushcraft overseas uh, like I say I did a little bit of it me and my friends would go out to the woods and stuff we'd go camping on occasion you know we would try different things I don't know if you saw my video where I talked about my first bushcraft knife so I was getting into it, there just wasn't, like, there's not a lot of places to do it in the UK, unfortunately. Wild camping is kind of a no-no. So, a lot of bushcrafting is kind of a no-no. So, yeah, there wasn't a lot of places to it unless you went up to Scotland and drove for, like, seven, eight hours or something. So, I, like I say, I was starting to do it, and I did do it, but not, like anywhere near like I was doing here so uh, next question Bon Pesh Bon Pesheur which Sylvan my buddy Sylvan 
Is my family impressed with all the scenery they see out here? Uh, yes, they are. Um, I mean, it all depends on what type of scenery you enjoy. I mean, some of them are, some of them aren't. It's one of those things like, you know, they think it's beautiful. Uh, like my mum and my sister are, are beach people, really, I'd say. So it's probably not as impressive to them. I know my younger brother enjoys this sort of thing, so he's taken, he's been out here with me before. He's taken trips to Sweden. My older brother likes it. They watch my videos and stuff. I think they're really, I think they're impressed by it. I think it's one of those things. My dad has been coming here since the 70s, so he's seen it all before, so it's nothing, <laughs> nothing new to him. Uh, but yeah, I think so. I think it's everyone enjoys it a lot of my friends enjoy it as well obviously like the guys i was saying we'd go to the woods and hang out and do this sort of thing with so they really like it so yeah i think so it's very different to what we have in the uk so yeah i think now okay richard scarponi if i could do any adventure trip what would it be uh again like i say right now it's it's yellowstone I would look, and again, uh, in terms of like an adventure, adventure trip, I'd love to go to the Amazon. Like, that'd be up there. Like a proper, like in terms of an adventure. Not just, uh, you know, a backpacking trip, like a real adventure. I'd love to go to the Amazon. The Amazon rainforest, somewhere deep in the Amazon. That'd be cool. Richard Scarponi also asks, what kind of mileage am I doing when I go on these trips? Uh, good question. I mean, it all depends. It all depends. Again, uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Obviously, how I'm feeling, the time of year and stuff. Like, uh, in terms of, I don't, well, you mean hiking, I think. So, like, obviously, I drive a good couple of hours to get here. But, like, today, like I say, I'm only 200 yards from my truck. But that's a rare occasion. Uh, in the summer, obviously, I'm doing more miles than I would in the winter. In the winter, it might only be two, three miles. Uh, just because I don't own snowshoes and trekking in the snow can be a pain. I mean, it like it all depends on the conditions, really. Uh, in the summer, I could do, I could easily do a lot more miles. Obviously, in the summer, things are busier there's more people like in the winter you can kind of get away with going to areas that in the summer would be really busy and the nice thing about in the winter is because of the snow uh, it sort of creates you know it levels things out a bit more sorry I've got a bug up my nose <laughs> yeah it levels things out a bit more so you can sort of go back into the woods off trail and set up camp that way because a lot of times uh in the northeast there's not a lot of flat ground especially when you get into the mountains it's all you know old granite mountains i believe so there's a lot of jutting out rocks and stuff so so yeah i mean it but then in the summer like i say it's so it could be so much busier so i might have to drive you know 10 miles down an old dirt logging road to get to a trailhead and then hike eight miles ten miles nine miles just to get away from people you know what i mean so it's really dependent in the summer like if you watch my last video i talked about like how i feel like there's there's a lot less to do in the summer does that make sense like in the winter it's all about camp chores uh, you know making a nice comfortable camp getting firewood together you feel like you're busy 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 and you're always fighting the daylight because it gets dark so quickly so you're sort of like moving around camp a lot more doing all these things and then in the summer it's like you can you don't have to worry about that so much you can walk off into the you know 20 30 yards into the woods behind camp and grab a bunch of sticks and light it no problem and it's hot so you don't a lot sometimes you don't really need feel like a fire so like if I like I talked about in my last video I feel like I need to be doing mileage it's all about mileage so yeah it's all it's all dependent like I say it might be two three miles or it could be ten miles and that's obviously that's not out and back that's just to get in there so yeah it really depends it really depends
you know it's hard to tell sometimes because like you might only see like you know three shots of me hiking but I might have done I might hike five six miles so it's, it all depends really it all depends Jason Jackson Jason Jackson asks what does Brooks and Birches mean <laughs> that's a good question I mean the simple answer is it just means like a brook is in like a stream or a creek and a birch is in like a birch tree because that's what I that's the type of stuff I'm around a lot of the times on these trips uh, in terms of how I ended up with that name it's a good story I guess when I first started my YouTube channel it was under my name which is Rob Thompson uh, but obviously searchability is a huge thing on the internet and I am unlucky enough either depending how you look at it I am unlucky enough that I share my name Rob Thompson with a baseball coach who used to coach the New York Yankees and I believe he's still a baseball coach I don't know what team he coaches now but he used to coach the Yankees and he's still around so when I first started out and I have no subscribers no nothing you search Rob Thompson and all you would get was videos about this baseball coach so that didn't work so then I changed my name to Thompson Woods which was supposed to be like you know because that's where it really started like I said my dad teaching me how to light a fire in the woods behind our house so and I thought that would be searchable and it kind of was until and I don't know if anyone knows this or even cares but there was a thing where <laughs> Oh god, what was it? The the friend the friend of the younger sister of one of the Kardashians cheated on, you know, made out with the boyfriend of one of the older Kardashians. So yeah, something like that and uh <laughs> his name was Tristan Thompson. He's a basketball player for the Cleveland Cavaliers and her name was Jordan Woods. So whenever you typed in Thompson Woods from that point on, all you got in the search results was, uh, you know, videos about this Kardashian cheating scandal, which was like, so that was no good. And then I was out one day and I was just sort of, you know, looking around and thinking about it and it came up with Brooks and Birches. I thought the alliteration sounded nice and I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. It sounds, it sounds, you know, it it does what it says on the tin. You know what I mean? It's that's where I'm at. That's the sort of stuff I'm in. I've used birch bark to light the fires. I'm near these little brooks and stuff. Oh yeah, that'll be a cool name. I liked it and I just ran with it. So that's where, that's what brooks and birches means, and that's how I ended up with it, which is strange. Um. Olga Kra Kra Krausik Olga Krausik 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 I'm so sorry I'm Krauchik Olga Krauchik I'm really sorry I don't I don't know how to say that I apologize um, she asked Olga asked when do I plan on visiting the UK again uh, that's a very good question and the answer is I have no idea obviously right now they have like a two-week quarantine to go there uh, coronavirus has sort of put any plans to travel outside the country even outside the state on hold so I don't know I don't know if I'll be going there again and she did ask if when I go do go there I will make a video and I will I will absolutely next time I go I'll take some stuff with me and I'll go and try and make a a bushcraft camping video out there but in terms of when I'll get to go there again I don't I don't know at this point I don't know I think it's my dad's 60th birthday this year in fact I know it is and I would like to go for that but we shall see Ashish Kumar asked what does the channel name mean as I said before it you know it's just 
like brooks, like a stream, a creek, a river, which type deal, in which a brook is a small version of a river. And birches, it refers to the birch trees that I'm in a lot of times. Bobby Socks asked, strangest thing that's happened in the wilderness? Uh, I think the strangest thing or the coolest thing that's happened so far that I can remember uh, is the coyotes that were there on that night when it was really cold and they were howling outside camp. I say that's the strangest thing because you know they wouldn't leave when I was yelling at them so I don't know what was happening uh, and I've never had them that close before so that's probably the, the strangest thing that I've had happen in the wilderness that I can think of that I can remember but yeah that's those coyotes was probably the strangest thing you also asked about the water filtration as I said before obviously my catadine b3 water filter that's what I use for water filtration when I'm out here or I boil water as well and turn to boil water if I'm cooking Effie Ghent asked how long have I lived in the US and how did I end up here? I will have lived here per, as a permanent resident, I guess you would call it, uh, five years in September of this year. Came here in September 2015. Oh, Blue's got a squirrel up a tree. So yeah, September 2015, so it'll be five, five years in 2020, but I'd been here I'd come here for business trips um, starting around September 2014 so I'd, I'd known it for a, a year before I ended up making the move permanent and the reason I ended up here uh, was because I worked for a company in the UK or I worked at the, the UK office for a while for a number of years and then the option, well the story, you know, you want to know the actual story? It was at a point, I was at a point, I was quite young as well, I was 23, but I'd been working for a while. And I had to make a decision whether I was going to buy a house and do that and settle, or I was going to go somewhere else and try something new and different. And... I basically flipped a coin <laughs> and it said do something new and different and then so that's when I decided I was going to do something different and go somewhere new and then I got the opportunity to come here like I say I'd been I came here to sort of you know see what it was like and work with the people at the factory in the US on a new product that they just acquired and after doing that for you know close to a year well nine months six months nine months of doing that and going back and forth then they offered to make it permanent and that's what i did and i came here and like i said i've been here five years in september so so Pierre, Pierre Agnelli, I think you're, he's another Brit who lives in the US, I believe you live out in Minnesota, or Michigan, one of the two, but I know he's another Brit who, who moved out here to the US, <laughs> and he asks me, what is my greatest transition to life in America, which is a hot button question, I guess, <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, my wife's gonna kill me. My wife's gonna kill me. Um, honestly, I mean, obviously, I haven't. I've spent a bit of time on the west coast. I haven't really spent any time in the middle of the country. Obviously, I live in upstate New York, and I would say that my greatest transition to life in America so far has been the volume. <laughs> <laughs> oh god um yeah uh i mean i come from quite a quiet reserved family anyway but it's definitely louder it's definitely louder 
and it's not that it's not like everyone is loud the problem is there's just there's always loud guy loud guy and uh, other people know what i mean if you're on the more reserved scale you'll know what i mean but loud guy is like he always feels the need to talk like 10 decibel i don't know how many decibels louder than anyone else like for some reason that's going to make him sound better or smarter i don't know but all it takes is for him to enter a bar or a restaurant or a conversation and then all of a sudden everyone else feel everyone else talks and tell him to instead of just telling him to shut up everyone else starts talking louder and louder to try and get louder than loud guy until it gets to a point where you can't you just can't hear anything you can't you can't understand what anyone's saying or you know someone's like 12 inches away from me and they're just shouting at me and i'm like yeah <laughs> again that might just be where i live but yeah probably the volume probably the volume and then bob bob mckilhenny mckill mckill m-c-i-l-h-e-n-n-y bob mckilhenny mckilhenny i don't i apologize i don't know how to say it um, what's my emergency plan when I roll my canoe? Uh, I mean, obviously, the main thing is I always make sure I wear my PFD, my life jacket. As I talked about before, I always carry more than one way to light a fire on my person. So if I roll my canoe and I end up in the water, number one, I should be able to float with my life jacket on. Did you get it? I don't know. Um, hopefully be able to get to shore and then obviously try and light a fire and that would be my main objective hopefully now phones are kind of waterproof as well so maybe i'd have that i don't know but yeah that would be the main thing is always make sure i've got my life jacket on and do a, you know try my best to get to shore and i don't light a fire uh, Bob also asks, am I a tailgater or am I get there when we get there type of guy? Uh, I'm a, I'm not a tailgater at all. My wife gets so mad at me because I'm kind of a speed limit person. Uh, like, I, just the thought of having to spend money on a speeding ticket drives me nuts. So I'm just always like, I'm a get there when we get there. And the same goes... Because if we start, if we're late leaving, then it's like drives me nuts because I just like to go at the speed limit and then obviously she wants me to go faster because we need to get there. So yeah, I'm going to get there when we get there, guy. Um, next question from Bob is, do I have any intention of doing the show as your rod challenge? Which I hope that's not a euphemism. Uh, I guess you mean just show off my fishing gear and my fishing tackle. Uh, I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, I don't really intend on doing it. I mean, I can show people the tack, you know, the the stuff I bring. I think I just have a, you know, I have two ugly stick rods. I have a short one for trout fishing, an ultralight action one for trout fishing. Then I have a medium action one that's a bit longer, probably six, seven foot for bass fishing and then on my trout fishing reel I have a Fluga, Fluga President spinning reel and then I on my other one for bass fishing I have uh, I believe it's a Luz Max Speed 2 because it has the higher gear ratio for reeling in faster so yeah, those, that's my fishing gear. I don't have any intention of doing a show as your rod challenge. But if there is one, I'm, I can do. And then finally, Bob. Bob also asks if I will tell Kelly that he loves you and will you marry him? So, congratulations to Bob and Kelly. That's one of the questions he asked. So, that's awesome. Congratulations, guys.
Peters. Limited release. Toasted barrel finish. Kentucky sour mash. Sour mash whiskey. Whis whiskey. 86 proof. 43% alcohol. Michter's batch number 19G1243. Toasted barrel finished sour mash Kentucky whiskey. We are proud to offer this special release of our toasted barrel finished Kentucky sour mash whiskey. After full maturation in a hand selected charred white oak barrel, we finish our US number one sour mash whiskey in a new barrel that has been toasted to our exacting specifications at peak flavour is further mellowed by our signature filtration. I told you I had a nice bottle. Uh, my, so the liquor store at the top of my road actually has a very good selection, I never realised. Up on the top shelf, the uh, top shelf liquor. They have a number of nice whiskies. Some that were well above my price range, but this is a $225 bottle in their store. And I wanted to celebrate one year. Our channel's one year anniversary and I wanted to do it properly with a steak and some bourbon. So, one thing I want to say to everyone, I think right now we hit 20,000 subscribers and I've been practicing this and I'm not going to use my phone, I promise. I'm going to turn off the timer so it doesn't interrupt me when I say thank you, gracias, merci. Danke, obrigado, gamsa nida, arigato, sheshe, tesheke ederum, terima kasi. And I can't remember any of the other ones, so I apologize, but that means thank you in a bunch of different languages. It's been a good year. It's been a good year. Obviously a bittersweet moment with everything that happened in the world over the past couple of months and everything that's happening right now. Typically I don't like to talk about that sort of stuff because obviously I want, I want this to be a place of positivity and positivity only. So with that being said, what I will say is that this channel has given me the pleasure and the privilege to be able to engage with people from all corners of the world and across the entirety of this country and from all different backgrounds and we've been able to share our ideas, our thoughts, our passion and our love for bushcraft and the outdoors. And I think as long as we continue to focus on the meaningful connections that bring us together and not the superficial things that set us apart, everything will be okay. Cheers, guys. Wow. That is so smooth. That is so smooth. It, it doesn't have that like, oh, 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 you know, that flavor. It's also with the ice. It's one of the reasons why I also figured I'd do the truck camping because I wanted to bring a nice bottle. And I can't, I can't disrespect a good whiskey. Can't be drinking it out of a titanium mug. I gotta have a glass with some ice, you know what I mean? I gotta really respect it. It's very nice. It's very good. Right, I need to flip my steak.
Oh, let it ride for too long. Well, I do like a bit of char. Oh yeah, she's done. She's done. It's hot. Okay. Well, you ate that quick. It's very good. I went with Delmonico. I like it. Nice fatty, fatty steak. Mm. A little overdone, especially on one side. But I like a good bit of char. I do. I'm a char fan. Makes me let. Reminds me that I've been cooking over a flame, you know? Good girl. I love you. Right. I'm gonna eat this. And as always, if anything changes, I'll get back with you. I love you. Okay, Blue and I living in luxury in this big tent. So bright, but we're gonna go to sleep now. Sat by the fire, listen to our book for a while. Oh uh, yeah, it's been nice. It's been a good relaxing evening. Oh God, excuse me. I'm glad I did this. I love this spot, this lake. I've been here a number of times. I've been here with my wife and my son, and I've been here with my brother and my friends, and I've been here with my cousin Matt. So it's just nice. It was really good. It's probably one of my favorite spots. So yeah, anyway, I will see you guys in the morning. <laughs> I'm getting it up. I'm getting up. I am. I am. Okay, okay, okay. Okay.
Well, good morning. Blue's been out here for the past hour. So I've been sleeping, chasing squirrels. Let's see what she's. You digging holes? Do you get him? I could hear a little red squirrel giving it a. I don't know if he's still stuck up a tree somewhere. But she's been she's been on his case. <sighs> Excuse me, sorry. This video is probably long enough, but again, thank you guys. Thank you to every single one of you. It's been a great year. And next video we'll probably be back to our regular scheduled programming. So thanks again. And if you like this, give it a like. Go back and watch some of my other videos if you haven't seen them. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you on the next one. Take it easy.